Bottini, when I did my doctorate, I had to decide mm -hmm. whether to do it in physics or brain science. I chose the latter, but I've always known that physics is fundamental. What, what does that mean? So, <laughs> it's a bit difficult when you compare these two, because I think I wish I had done my PhD in brain science. <laughs> it's extremely interesting. Um, <coughs> So the usual answer to why physics is fundamental is that everything else boils down to physics. So biology boils down to chemistry, which boils down to fundamental physics. And it is the traditional, well-known reductionist approach to the world, which is not true. I don't think it's true. Um, because what it misses is that when you go to the upper levels, when you go from um, the physics of elementary particles to a living being the, or even before that, when, when you go from atoms of hydrogen to a cube of ice, there can be novelty <laughs> in, in what arises at the higher levels. And that's the whole discussion of emergence on which we understand very little. So I think that what is fundamental about physics is that it always addresses very fundamental questions. And now this question of novelty um, arising at the different levels when you go from the underlying to the next one and how does this happen is also part of physics. Um, it also does ask very basic old questions that, do, that fall into the realm of physics, such as what was the beginning of the universe and how did the universe um, come about, what are the most fundamental constituents of matter, um, how small can you go, it doesn't seem to me to be everything because, of course, asking how the brain works is just <laughs> as fundamental and it is not part of physics. So there is, I, I, I wouldn't think that physics has the only fundamental questions, but for sure there is a very big part of physics that is fundamental. Well, let's talk about some of the categories of physics that is fundamental, the elementary particles and the forces, for example. Right. And what can we say about those? So I, I guess at this point we have a pretty good understanding of the elementary particles and the forces. Um, we don't have a very good understanding of mass and where mass comes from in the sense that um, usually, for example, we do think that mass is in elementary particle physics is given by uh, the Higgs particle, which at this point we have not seen. So if we do see that, then we, you can say that you understand pretty much everything. Um, on the other hand, there is a, a different category of things about elementary particles that we do not understand, which is um, just basic quantum theory. So elementary particles are quantum. Um, we know how to deal with that. We know how to describe them. I wouldn't say that we understand quantum theory in any real way. So in some sense, we understand them very well, that we can describe them very well. But there are other levels of understanding. I'm not exactly sure how to explain mm -hmm. that when you, you have a sense that you know why things are the way they are, and that I suppose we don't understand. <laughs> what about the general assumptions of space and time? The, these have been subject to radical revision over the 20th century. Right, so I think, I mean, that's of course a huge part. So, so before Einstein, you had this idea that space and time is, well, obviously there, and nothing very much to be done about. Space and uh, time became plastic with Einstein. It became a dynamical thing that we can affect. So the idea that space-time tells matter where to go and matter tells space-time how to curve <laughs> is a radical idea. But even that seems to be not good enough. So in quantum gravity, now probably what's going on is what we're seeing is that the whole notion of space and time is probably not really fundamental. So space... That, that sounds incredible, that space and time is not fundamental. Space yeah. and time seem, in an ordinary sense, to be the most fundamental thing, and everything else seems to happen in space and time as sort of the fixed background. Right, which is what makes this problem so exciting and so strange that I, I don't know of any description of anything that we have that is not in space-time. So uh, so I guess the problem is how could you describe a world without space-time? Again here you have to separate because um, I'm not so sure that you can describe a world without a time, but describing a world without space 
is an easier job. <laughs> so, um, so th but then it, there's a lot of interesting questions that come up here because, for example, the thing that you're supposed to have learned from Einstein is that you cannot spa separate space-time into space and time. But yeah. maybe yeah. this is not true. Maybe yeah. they are different and maybe there's a way in which time is actually more fundamental than space. Uh, at least, I hope so. <laughs> Because I'm really stuck if I try to think of the world without time. If things, if there is no time, then things do not happen. So the whole notion of describing anything, I don't even know where to start. But what could be happening is that there are two different notions of time, a more fundamental one and an emergent one. That, so it's the emergent one that is part of the space-time, but there is a more fundamental oh. one that makes sense without space. Now, neither one of those new ways uh, are, are, uh, are obvious to us in our common perception, obviously. But Einstein put space and time together, which was a radical change. What you're saying is that the time that he might have unified with space may be an emergent time, That's and there's right. something more fundamental, more fundamental in time. One. But you're, you're trying to do away with space altogether? With space, yes. Uh, but that is a bit easier to do away with. Well, it um, doesn't sound that easy to me. <laughs> well, uh, it's not so bad. So, for example, you could do things like replace notion of distances and things like that with a network. So that is a very common way to model things before space. So instead of talking about how far you're away from me, I might be talking about how well you're connected to me. Oh. Um, and you can have a notion of a world which is just a connectivity. And that you can model by a graph. Uh, and then what you're looking for is properties of space to become emergent from this. So what you think of space, for example, a property of space is translations. So you're here and then you can be moved one meter further. Mm. Uh, this is translation, it's a property of space. So you might be starting with a network and in the beginning the network has no notions of translation and you're trying to get to a phase of your system that has such notions. Then you say space emerges. But the, the problem with time is that if I don't have time, I don't know how to say something emerges, right? <laughs> That's where time is actually different than space. I can mm. get properties of space emerging, but I don't know what emergence means with no time. Uh, now, when you have space uh, be an emergent property of a network, Yes. now the common thought would be th this network is where? What, what is a network? It's, it, it's, right. a, it's an abstract uh, 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 connection points? Yes. So, so the, because the network can't be in space because then it's... That's right. Uh, so the network is not anywhere. Right. Um, <laughs> so one uh, way that you could think of it is that um, you could still have a notion of the world is made of subsystems and the subsystems are connected. And this notion is not space, mm -hmm. right? So, um, so that's really what you mean by a network. You can split the world in some sort of fundamental parts, and they're connected, which tells you something about how much they interact, presumably. Um, but that does not imply space. Mm. Space is a very special kind of connectivity, if you like. A and space would come out of that, yeah. and, and we would see space because there's a network. It didn't have to, but it does. Because the network has special properties. Uh -huh. So, for example, if the network becomes a regular square grid, then, like, lots of squares put together, mm -hmm. right? Um, so then you can say that there is some obvious kind of space in there, in that now I have translations I can move across my grid. And, uh, but if the network was a big mess, or if everybody's connected to everybody else, so, for example, that's a good thing to think about. So let's say that you have a network where everybody's connected to everybody else. Would you call this space? So if you are one node in this network, but you're connected to everybody else, then It's like wor one wormholes everywhere. Yeah, wormholes everywhere. <laughs> then one step takes you to everybody, yeah. right? <laughs> so then this thing has no notion of locality. Yeah. So you would not say that this is space. Something that has no locality, where if you just put out your hand, you reach everybody in, in the whole universe, there is no space there. Yeah. Um, so you can start from such a description and then try to see how such a thing becomes um, a, a network that has notion of distances where it takes you actually a while to get somewhere mm. and you get to some people before other people. And that's what is really you mean by space. You mean neighborhoods, locality, closer, further, here and there. 
but you could pretty easily construct a network that has no useful such notions, such as everybody connects everybody else. Now, what is the benefit of, of so changing our notion of space to a network? Uh, does that help you uh, discern deeper uh, uh, relationship between uh, um, quantum mechanics or relativity, forces, particles? Uh, what is the benefit of getting rid of space as a fundamental uh, property? So, I guess that brings you back to the question of why do you want a quantum theory of gravity? Mm -hmm. so, um, so, one possible way to say this is that Einstein's theory of general relativity breaks down. So, for example, it predicts there is a black hole, but it doesn't tell you what's in the black hole. It just gives infinities all over the place. It's the same with the beginning of the universe. You get infinities all over the place. Um, so, also in quantum field theory, which is the best theory that we have to describe matter, you also don't have a very good understanding of what happens when you go very small in space. So, it tells you that you could go infinitely small in space, but it your theory gives you infinities. Which, so when your theory gives you infinities, means that you have no useful theory, really. So what we know is that um, if you look close, the notion of space has a problem. But you don't know where the problem is. So people have tried to make all sorts of solutions to that. Uh, for example, make quantum versions of space, um, which have various degrees of success. But in some way, the question you want to really answer is when do you have ordinary space? So that seems to be reasonably special because there are places where you do not have ordinary space, mm -hmm. such as inside a black hole. Mm -hmm. So in order to now make a distinction between ordinary space and the space, <laughs> if there is such a thing inside a black hole, you have to start trying to think of physics without space. Mm -hmm. And that's where, I guess, things like modeling um, pre-space by a network is pretty useful. I'm not so sure that that is the correct thing, obviously. Um, but you have to, I think the real difficulty is that it's, it's actually really hard to think of the world without space and time. And what you find is often that people have built it in. in they think that it's not there, but their intuition is based on it. So the exercise is somehow to try to make an intuition. I, I think that you do have to have an intuition about what you're doing. Otherwise, it's very difficult to make a theory. Um, so you have to, to train yourself in some way to to. To, to identify what about space is special. But you have fun trying to create a world without space. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> um, most of the time one is stuck, <laughs> which I wouldn't describe as fun, but uh, when it works, it's fun.